right. So, brothers. Yeah. So then, yeah. it, it maybe in a few sentences, uh, what, do you, what, is it, what does it mean to be a man of God? What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? I think, I think there's, well, the Bible speaks about it in a few different ways, but, like, the two scriptures that come to my mind are, um, it's First Timothy 6, 11, I believe, where it says, but as for you, O man of God, um, like, flee these things, like the love of money and other things that were mentioned earlier in the text. But it's what it says for the man to pursue that I think is important. Like, a man of God pursues righteousness, he pursues godliness, he pursues faith, love, um, like, steadfastness, and a missing one. Gentleness. Mm. Gentleness. And, uh, like, those are the things that a man of God pursues. Like, that's what you were talking about identity before. Like, if you think about what a man of God should look like, like these are the things that you're seeing him do, and therefore he takes them on as his pursuit of who he is. And also, there was another verse that I thought was interesting because it was kind of related to what you were saying earlier about, um, like, being strong, right? So in First Corinthians sixteen thirteen, it says, "Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong." Mm. Right? So, like for me, like that, I just use those two verses, but that's kind of like how the Bible speaks about it. But I also wanted to say that a man of God is one who emulates God and yeah. His character. Yeah. Like that's probably the best way yeah. I could summarize it. I agree, and I think it's just important for us to, yeah, would, to I, say I, that. I would echo that, right? Because. Yeah. One of the things that we wrestle with is what is the difference between uh, a man and being a man of God? Yeah. Right. And there's a lot of overlap, right? Yeah. Responsibility, integrity, trustworthiness. Um, but one of the things that separates them is who they rely on, right? A man, um, apart from God, is going to rely primarily on himself, mm-hmm. maybe on some of his connections that he has with uh, other people. Uh, in his community, mm-hmm. things of that nature. Again, none of that is implicitly wrong, but a man of God actually needs to be r- relying on God. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm reminded of the story of David when uh, he had raided the Amalekites, and while he was gone, his wife and children, everybody was taken, yeah. Yeah. and he had to go and find them. The men were so bitter who were with him that they yeah. thought about even stoning him. Yeah. But it says <laughs> David strengthened himself in the in Lord. The Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So he wasn't relying simply on his own ability. Yeah. Right, because if you know the story of David, he had lots of skills, lots of training. He was a man of war. Yeah, he could have just said, "This I'm going to rely on my own experience here." Yeah, but no, but he strengthened himself in the Lord first. Yeah, and then he found his direction from there. Yeah. So I really think that you know, in terms of being a godly man, uh, your your strength, your purpose, yeah. who you are, has to actually rely on God first. Yeah. And everything else flows from that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say very quickly is that your identity, it's, it's, I always go back to identity. A lot of people find identity in their careers. Mm-hmm. A lot of people find identity in, in other titles that people give them. Yeah. But the man of God finds his identity in God. Yeah. And so um, as a father has a child and the child bears the last name of their father, as sort of an identity, I think that the man of God, in everything that he does, we spoke about integrity, when nobody's looking, yeah. um, you know that, well, this is not who I am. And you know that I answer to the Father. Yeah. And so a man of God, he, he understands who he is. He understands why he does what he does. He understands who he represents. He understands who he's come from. And so as to your point, he relies on God. Um, when no one's looking, he knows that God is the final, has the final say. Um, the man of God wants to be in the image of God. And I think that that's... That's definitely an important yeah. piece. And, and you bring up a good point because, like you said, mm-hmm. um, in our tradition, uh, our children carry our last name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in many other uh, cultures, it's the reverse, actually. Mm. The children take on the first name of the father, mm. right? Um, for much of the same reason, right? right? Because you're literally carrying the name That's of right. your, your father, That's right. right? So you go to school, you go to work, you get into trouble, or you get praised. It literally goes back, to the not, to the, not to the mom. Yes. But yes. to the father specifically, right. they're going to ask questions about, well, it's not your boy? Yeah. It's not your girl? Like, what? Yeah. Why you know, are the son? Yeah. Why are you? And it's not even going to hide because they literally have your name. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so I, I want us to transition to a different uh, point here because yeah. we talk about the importance of being a man and more so the importance of being a godly man. And so it makes sense that godly men will be found in church. It but, makes sense. Yeah. I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but the numbers 
talk about a different truth mm, okay. because the, the fact of the matter is that when we look across our congregations yeah. and when we talk about percentage wise, yeah. there seems to be a overwhelming majority of congregants that attend church on a regular basis tend to be female mm-hmm. than male. Yeah. But we just finished our discussion of how, how, how important it is for um, society for have, to have men in society men with integrity, men who are trustworthy, men who can carry responsibility. So why are these men lacking in our churches? And again, I'm speaking in general, but in our churches, we're far away by the, the female population. Why, why, why do you think that is? What is the, the, the church that's not providing, that's not attracting or developing? Yeah. And maybe those two different <clears throat> things. Yeah. Um, but what's the issue there? What do you think? I think there's, well, that's, wow. <laughs> I think that's a really big question. And I think there's a lot of layers to it. Um, I was actually watching uh, a video the other day um, on this specific topic. And obviously, we don't have time to go through the whole video. It was like over an hour long. But just some of the key things that I took away from the video was that in a lot of ways, men don't necessarily feel engaged in church. And what I mean by that, or I guess what the person was saying in the video, is that men don't feel connected to necessarily what's going on. Sometimes the way that church is portrayed, it's a, it's sometimes portrayed very like like very emotive. It's it's portrayed as like, you know, sit down, listen, someone talk to you, but don't really do anything about it. Like that's not really like you were talking about like what's innate in a man. Yeah. A lot of times men feel like we need to do something, or they feel like I want to be a part of something that I see like changing the environment or you know accomplishing something, not just sitting down, listen to somebody else tell me what I need to do. Um, I think also a lot of times, too, it's because representation is not necessarily present. So in a lot of these churches, not necessarily our own local assemblies, but I've seen other local assemblies where you see, like, the women are the pastors, the women are the ministers, the women practically do everything. So it's kind of like, well, where are the men? Yeah. So, like, why would I put myself in an environment where I don't even see men doing anything? Right. Right? Um, and maybe just one last thought, and then you guys can jump in with your own, is I think sometimes why it's also a challenge, too, is because in a lot of ways, um, the relevance of the church is also starting to decline. I was actually having a conversation with somebody earlier today about how, in a lot of ways, the church is, or was considered like the main vehicle of, was considered a main facet of like the family life. Mm-hmm. The, the, you know, we were kind of yeah. talking about it earlier yeah. about like what it was like before, but like in a lot of ways now church has like become almost like an optional experience. Right. Right. So it's, you know, before men were in the church, right? Men, their wives, their children, they were in the church. Right. Now it's kind of like, you're not even seeing really families. Right. So I just think there's a lot that, I think there's a lot that goes into answering that question. Those are just some of my immediate thoughts. No, I, I agree. I think <clears throat> one of the big pieces is it's not practical. It, it, I find that, and this is just my thoughts, I find that church is a lot of singing and perhaps preaching, um, a lot of things that are within the four walls. Mm-hmm. And I think men need something a little bit more. I, I personally believe that there should be more um, perhaps engagement in community, perhaps uh, a sense of building something and addressing a need. Perhaps, um, you know, I, I don't know what that is, but I just find that church that is just sort of worship and preaching and, and teaching and whatsoever else, I don't know if a man gravitates to that yeah. as much as something that's more hands-on, something that's more practical. Um, you know, I, I heard of a program, and, I, you know, I'm not even going to quote it because I don't even remember the full name, but when there's a disaster, um, they, they get together and they, they put out an appeal and they build homes, <coughs> and they build homes for those who have lost their homes or those who are in need. And I think that that appeals more for a man. He, a man feels like I am... You know, I am meeting a need. I am filling a gap. I am, I am bearing the load. And I think that church today doesn't necessarily have that. I think more churches is, is really you come and you listen and, and you, you go home. But one thing I would yeah. say, Pastor Mark, sorry to interject, yeah. is just there are responsibilities in the church. Absolutely. I actually would say that I think the Bible is kind of clear that men should be leading in the church. Absolutely. Like, first of all, I will go on record in saying I don't even think it's right to see 
like a woman leading a church. Yeah. I think that role is specifically spoken Absolutely. of in scripture that like a man should. So that's like step one. I agree. Right. But now we're in a time where it's kind of like fluid. Like people are like, well, you know, she can preach. So I guess she should be the pastor. Like, no, like yeah. the, the Bible is very clear about the roles, like especially as it pertains to like the ministry or like the overseeing of a local body, even the deacons. Yeah. Right. Like the Bible says, like both the overseer and the deacon, they should be husbands of one wife. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I think that when we don't, when the absence of men leads to the default of other things happening, which is interesting because it's kind of like the Bible speaks about men being in a position of standard. But you're not seeing that anymore. So sure. then what happens is we try to fill the gaps with other things or other people. And, you know, I think personally, if we're going to have a strong church, we need men to not only step up, but own their yeah. responsibility. And I'm glad to say that even like in an environment like our own, like there are men who do handle their responsibilities, yeah. Yeah. both in the family and in the church. But we need to see that more across the board. So do you think that we just don't have enough examples of godly men in the church? Then is, is, that, is that the issue? Because I can hear men saying, listen, yeah. I can't attend a certain church yeah. where I feel like if the pastor and I get into an altercation, I can take him out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I want my pastor to be able to hold up yeah. a little bit. You know, I don't want him to get, you know, I don't want to walk in and see this effeminate pastor yeah. and be like, well, I don't want this to be. Like I'm submitting to, yeah, you know, and yeah, he's going to give me yeah. advice on how to be a godly man, but I don't respect him. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So is, is that a component as well, you think? I don't know if it's like, I think generally people respect, I think in general people respect like ministers, like if they're holding an office and they're doing, I think the issue is if, okay, maybe I should back up. Do I think, I think we could have more examples like to answer your first question directly, I think we could have more examples in the church, but I think that we don't, we also don't give enough credence to the ones who are doing a good job. They tend to Fair get enough. overshadowed. We almost always just talk about the bad ones mm -hmm. or the ones who clearly aren't doing a good yeah. job. But I think that there are people that I can say, I look up to that person, even if they're not perfect, they don't have all their stuff together, but I know that they're trying to do their best for God. Yeah. And I think that if somebody's saying, I, I'm looking for a church. I want to submit, but like, I need to see my pastor. Like at the very least, the pastor is supposed to be doing God stuff, right? Yeah. Like he should be doing that well. But then I also want to say that I think it's important for us to note that a lot of times people are looking for people that they can emulate. Yeah. And if they're not seeing what they're looking for, then they're going to look somewhere else until they find it. But e even yeah. on that point though, it's, it's, it's like our pastor's real. Yeah. Are we, you know, are we real enough? So, yeah. um, you know, in our sermons, in our teachings, are we talking about real life issues? Are yeah. we, are we speaking about perhaps um, lust, you know, or do we shy away from those things yeah. and pretend like those things don't exist? Yeah. Do, do our auxiliary groups deal with how to, how to get ahead in our careers? So I'm just wondering like the relevance of it and do men, do men gravitate just towards you know flowery, flowery, flowery language, rather than just talking to us straight. Yeah. So I, even that could be a component of you know why men are lacking. I was talking to this one brother at our basketball program, and he's just like, honestly, I don't come to church because I don't understand what the pastor is saying. <laughs> I don't know what he's saying. I I, I don't identify yeah. with him. I'm not connecting, and and I'm not one of those 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 pastors or or person who thinks that uh, a, a pastor shouldn't use the word of God or shouldn't teach on the word of God. I don't, you, that's, the word of God is, is very essential, but maybe just the way that we come across, are we coming across like this is unattainable? Mm -hmm. Are we coming across like, you know, our pastor, Pastor Blago, he's like, yo, I have challenges too. Yeah. I had this and I, and I was doing this and perhaps we're not as um, transparent, yeah. you know, and just, just letting people know that we go through it too. And as you said, you want your pastor to be someone who you can identify with. He's, he's manly, he's, he's masculine, but he's also showing that he's, he's pursuing Christ. But that's, not he, just, yeah. but that's not just relegated to the pastor. No, that's I'm true. I'm talking that's just true. about the men in the, the church. church. That's right? true. Because it starts at the top, right? Oh, yeah. for sure. Right? Because yeah. the, the, the pastor and the, the rest of the ministers, they set the tone. Set the tone yeah. yeah. Right? So if they're saying, hey, listen, and, and, you know, I, in my earlier comments, being a little bit facetious, but, 
you know, you don't have to be like 6'4 and ripped in the gym <laughs> yeah. in order to be part of the clergy, right? Because yeah. the men are like, well, I'm not going to take him, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's more so the character of the person, yeah. right? Like, what are we doing in terms of showing integrity, showing responsibility, being an example, right? So I want us to transition to our, our next uh, uh, thought here, which mm-hmm. is, um, and you brought this up, is godly living still relevant in today's culture? Because it's all well and good in the church. Mm-hmm. It's all well and good to be trim and proper and talk about the word of God and how wonderful it is. But when we step outside uh, into the real world, quote unquote, um, does the principles that are taught in the church from the word of God, does it still play a role today? Does it actually help us today? Or is it actually to our detriment that we still carry on these kind of old time traditional beliefs? Mm. That's such a good point. Huh. I mean, sometimes when I'm in I'm I'm in certain situations, my reaction is like, honestly, I can't react as a Christian right now. <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah. I mean, sometimes in you know in a work setting and people are sliding you or you feel that you're you're in a position where you can't really trust somebody. And you're like, how am I going to be a Christian in this mm. situation? Like, I'm just going to be trampled here. I'm going to be crushed. So it's, it's, a, it's a valid question. And um, I know that, I, I think I, what I'd say is it's absolutely valid. It's absolutely relevant. But it takes so much growth. It takes so much growth to actually see that relevance. Um, because if you, if you don't and you just sort of try to apply it on the surface... I think you get crushed and you get discouraged. Yeah. You know, you get discouraged and you're like, I don't know if this Christianity. So I'll, I'll share a quick experience. I mean, I had this boss and he did everything wrong and he kept getting promoted. Wow. <laughs> he, and he lied and he, get, he got like two promotions. Yeah. And I'm like, God, does this thing really work? Yeah. yeah. What's going on? And here, right? this, this is not two years, three. This is like 11 years. Wow. So I'm like, does this God thing really work? And I'm a Christian, I'm a minister, but I'm like, man, God, is this for real? God they live in, am I supposed to just embrace this? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a question, but I think the relevance, you find the relevance when you actually get to a place uh, of maturity. That's when you see the true relevance. But be, if you're not at the place of maturity, sometimes you can really believe and you can even walk away thinking that Christianity is, is not is, is relevant in church, but it's not really relevant in those situations where it really calls for people to make tough decisions. Yeah, and I, I, I second that because, I, and, I, and I think it's a pertinent question, particularly for men, because there's a lot of pride and ego, mm. especially when it goes into careers yeah. or even into family, yeah. right? Because there's a certain expectation that as a husband or as a father, you know, we have to be able to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And Ricardo, you kind of talked to us before mm-hmm. about um, there's an expectation that, you know, we got to get it done because yeah. you're the last line of defense. Yeah. <laughs> and if it's not going to be you, well, then you're just going to be hearing it from your wife yeah. from <laughs> oh, Kingdom Come. Oh, well, yeah. Right. Um, but I, I, I struggle with this topic because in, in the same way, sometimes it seems that when you're applying some of the principles of godly manhood, it, it seems like you're almost taking a step back. Yeah, it does. That's what it feels like. It feels for real. It feels hard. Yeah, it, it, it feels like you're almost like a punching bag almost because you're trying to be humble. And because you're humble, you're, you're, you're practicing some sort of humility. You're getting trampled on, yeah. right? Um, or you try to be assertive, but you don't want to talk down to your colleague. But now your colleague's getting promoted because they seem like you may not be up to it. You know, you're thinking they're like, I was yeah. trying to be kind. I'm not yeah. going to lie. I'm not going to lie. I've questioned God many times. Yeah. Like, I'm just people. Uh, no, I'm being dead serious. No, like, me I've too. I've questioned God many me times because I'm like, God, I know this person does not walk in integrity. Yeah. And they're walking into a role where they need integrity, whether yeah. they like it or not. Yeah. But like, make it make sense, God. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. This one. No, no, no. And, and yeah. I think this is a, a real topic. Cause I think there's a lot of men who ask yeah. themselves that question. They yeah. say, listen, I hear what you're saying, and it sounds good in theory. In theory. In theory. But on a practical level, does this really make any sort of sense? Because if I'm going to do this, then I'm losing career status, fame, financial yeah. security. Yeah. 
fill in the blank, yeah. right? And it seems that, and, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why men aren't really showing up to mm. the church, right? Okay. Men aren't really respecting uh, ministers, right? right? Uh, in part because, you know, they're not seeing great examples. Yeah. But they're also seeing a lot of pain, too. Yeah. And I think part of the reason that we have to maybe explain better or dig in more is you talked about this piece of identity, yeah. but also talking about perspective mm. and vision, right? And understanding that in our broken world where we don't often have great fathers or we have far too few good fathers, yeah. right? Um, not to say there's none, but there's far too few or just none at all, right? So there's not a, per, a plethora of examples of where we're seeing good fatherhood. Right. strong fathers that aren't perfect, but you can see them progressing in the right way. And so in the Bible, Jesus talks about God, the father. He mm -hmm. says, listen, when you, uh, your kids ask you for food, you don't give them a stone. Yeah. You, you find them bread. Yeah. So how much so will God, the father, the creator of the universe, the one that knows you better than you know yourself, how much more would this father step up for you? Right. And sometimes our, we have a too short a vision yeah, to yeah. see, and we're looking at just our colleague, or we're looking at our neighbor, or right. we're looking at the person across in the next pew and going, I don't understand why God's working in this person's life. <laughs> this person is a, is a mess. <laughs> Here I am trying to follow the Ten Commandments, and yeah. I could have run through this person, but I, I chose not to. Yeah. And I, I don't feel like I'm getting rewarded. And at some point, it feels like, well, if I don't get the reward, then uh, maybe I should try something else. Yeah. And how do we guard against that? Because we... we we truly believe that godly living is the right way to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But how do we get over that hump that you're talking about? Use the example of seeing that yeah. uh, a boss of yours getting promoted, not over a few months or even a few <laughs> years, years, but like over a decade. Yeah. But staying in the, in the fight, so to speak, and saying, you know what, I'm still going to trust anyway, even though I, this yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. How would you advise uh, you know, someone who was in a similar situation? I think, I think God puts us through certain things for character building. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. character building, it, I always say this, that there's no shortcut to godliness. There's no shortcut to maturity. There's, I, I tried everything. I, you know, my wife was telling me to see it a certain way, and I'm like, I'm not hearing that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I tried to look for a new job, and, and God was like, go back to work. You know? And so I think it's just character building. And I think over time, um, you, you're, you're going to cry those tears until there's no more tears left. And then when you really come to the end of yourself, and you really come to the end of, all that you want in your own agenda, um, what's left is either to leave or you, con you, you conform or you transform into what God wants you to be. And I think that I, I've, reached, I've reached that point where it's like, okay, God, I've tried, I've tried everything. I'm done fighting. You know, let's do it your way. And I just yielded. And I'm like, you know what? Whatever he does to me, I'm going to eat it. Uh, I'm going to respond to him in love. I'm going to apply the word of God. Not because I wanted to. I mean, I wanted to apply the word of God, but I mean, I tried everything else. I've, I've tried to do my own thing and it's not working. And mm -hmm. to, to your point that godliness is actually the only thing that truly works and that truly wins. Anything other than godliness or a godly response to this broken world, you're just adding to the mess. Yeah. You're adding to it. So, you know, I think it's, it's something that we, we, we really have to grow into. And as you go through the hardship of being godly and feeling like you're the punching bag and feeling that you're left behind and you're never getting promotions and, and everything else, it builds a character that no, nothing else can um, really build that. Yeah, and I think also too, you, you wanna leave it a good example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, you need, you need to leave, it's not just you. Yeah. Because whether you like it or not, there's other people that are always looking. Yes. They're always observing. It's yes. the same way you're observing the person who's getting all the good stuff. And yeah. you're like, I know what's going on behind closed doors. <laughs> right? The same thing could be said about us. Yeah. They're and watching. So, and the, the people are watching. They're watching. Right? They're observing. Yeah. Right? And there's going to come a time where maybe you don't get that promotion. But that coworker looks at you and says, hey, I'm going through some family trouble. Can you help right. me? Because right. they know you're a man of integrity. Yeah. Right. Hey, listen, I'm going through financial troubles. Can, can you, I can trust you to uh, can tell you the intimate details of what's going on in my bank account, and I know it's not going to be posted on social media the next day, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. These are the kind of traits that we ought to have because not only do, God says that he'll take care of us, yeah. Yeah. right? He said, seek my kingdom first, seek my righteousness first, and everything else is going to be taken care of. Don't even worry about that. So I think, like, I think this is really important because 
even as you guys are talking, I was just reading some scripture. But the one thing that kind of comes to my mind is that you know a true man of God when you see him. Yeah. Like, you don't yeah. need to question. Like, the thing about godliness is that it has a. Like an aura. It has a distinct. I don't know if aura is the word. Are we allowed to use that word? <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. We can define it. We can. Yeah. Well, hopefully. But I was going to say there's something distinct about a person who you can tell is a godly person. And I think yeah. that's just how God naturally baked yeah. godliness, if that makes sense. But I think it's supposed to be distinct. It's supposed to cause people to be like, hmm, something different or unique about yeah. this person. They don't respond the way that other people do. They see situations that probably should get them yeah. like worked up, and they're like, okay, but I'm trusting the Lord. Yeah. They may not have to say those words, but in more or less terms, it. it's like they can see like, yeah, you probably should have been the person who got yeah. it, but like, yeah, I'm leaving it to the Lord. I was thinking of just like reading um, this one verse of scripture. I think it's really important. It's also in First Timothy chapter 4, where Paul says that, um, it's in verse 7, I'm just reading this from the English Standard Version. It says, Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, mm. godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So I just want to quickly focus on that last part because I think sometimes we look at godliness in terms of like the benefit for you in this life. Yeah. But remember, like, it's currency for the life to come. Yeah, like, right. we're not just living for this life. As a matter of fact, it goes we're not, back to perspective, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. It's all about your perspective because it's, if we're just living for this life, then Paul says we're men most miserable, yeah. right? Like, yeah. and if this is our hope and this is all it is, then it's sad, right? Because in this world, it's corruption, it's wickedness, all types of stuff, sin. But when my perspective is like, okay, not my will, but like, like the godly man says, not my will, like God's will. And even if that's even if that doesn't look like what I want, it doesn't necessarily mean that and it doesn't necessarily mean I don't have feelings about when stuff happens. Yeah. But it just says like, but I but my where I lean or like when Pastor Mark, like when it doesn't make sense or when I've had to go to God awkwardly about stuff, it's like my response should at some point get to the place like where Jesus was, where he's like, I don't want to do this in this moment. Yeah. Father. Like, I can feel the burden of responsibility. I'm about to take on the sins of the whole world. My flesh says, I don't want to do this. Yeah. But at some point, he got to the place where he's like, but I'm the God man. You know, Ricardo, yeah. and I think that this is what I'm talking about in terms of being real. I don't think we do that enough. Yeah. I think we talk about the ideal a lot. Yeah. We talk about, you know, at the end of the day, as you rightfully said, um, a, a man of God's motives his his final decision is to please the father or whatever else but what about the middle so i always ask god why do you give me these emotions yeah like in the midst of my storm i don't want to do this in the midst of my storm i want to react in my flesh in the midst of my storm i'm upset i'm angry and i think sometimes you know as we go back to sort of the relevance we, we speak ideals in church yeah and then people are like you know praise god you know, amen. And then they go home to someone who ill-treated them or took their money or whatever else. And they're, they're raging with all these emotions. And they're like, I'm supposed to apply the ideal? Like, wh mm. what are you talking about? Right? So I think we need to really validate and, and let people know that extra step that when this happens, you are going to be upset. You are going to be cheesed. You're going to be livid. You're going yeah. to be, you're going to want to, you know, react in the flesh. And that's okay. Yeah. Because you're you're being human, like you're gonna have I would emotions. Almost, could I just yeah, jump yeah, in? Absolutely. I would almost say that like if you don't feel like you're probably fake. Like let's just keep it a buck, right? Because the re I just told you, even Jesus felt. Right. Right. So if the master felt, surely you and I will feel. Right. Yeah. But I would even go as far as to say, Pastor Mark, that that struggle validates our Christianity. That's true. Right? That's true. Because like the Bible says that um, though we are in the flesh, we don't walk in the flesh, right? right? So it's important for us to realize that we still struggle. Yeah. But I think you told me years ago, and I've always held on to this, yeah. that like, God doesn't have a problem with our struggles. Right. God, sin is not even a problem right. for God. He already right. sent Jesus to deal with it. Exactly. So the in-betweens, I think what we need to rewarp 
<laughs> rework. <It's> okay. <laughs> rework. I mean, let's let's edit that word. That's out. the beauty of a podcast. You just make uh, up words on the spot. What we need to rework is this notion that a godly man is a perfect man in the sense that he has no struggles, no flaws. He's always in prayer meeting and fasting. So he's never said right. a bad word before. Exactly. He doesn't. He doesn't argue with his wife. He doesn't struggle when yeah. things go left, and he's yeah. can no. It, it just means that, he, but my pursuit is not to be exactly. a person who walks after the flesh. Amen. I want, the godly man says, I want to live for God. Right. I want to walk in the spirit. I want to actually do this thing practically. I want to sharpen myself with other brothers and other people in the body. But ultimately, I want to glorify God right. in my thoughts and my actions. But sometimes I struggle. Yeah. yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. What's not okay, though, is to pretend like. I got it all together. And I think that's maybe why a lot of people struggle with even coming to church sometimes because right. they're like, oh, church is full of hypocrites. Oh, yeah. church, there's no real people in there. That is not the case. Yeah. It's true. But that's unfortunately what gets marketed. And then people perpetuate lies and they think that, like, yeah, like everybody in the church is fake. No, no, obviously not. And I think that's just, you know, one thing I just want to personally dispel that there are people in the church who do keep it 100. Yeah. But For we real. need to establish stronger relationships in the church so that those that those don't have to become exceptions. Those can actually be seen as the norm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think to, to put a close on this, one topic that could be its own podcast by itself is this idea of men in loneliness. Ah. Whoa. Oh, my gosh. Whoa. It's a real, I would argue it's, uh, it was an epidemic. And it's becoming a, a pandemic. pandemic. Wow. Yeah. So uh, let me explain what I mean. Because with, and this really piggybacks off your point, Ricardo, because you were talking about it's hard um, because there's this picture or ideal of what a man should be, but we don't deal with the in-between. Yeah. Mm. One of the beauties of a men's ministry is you get the opportunity to, to hear the in-between. Yeah. The in-between. Yeah. Right? Yeah. To see it. Yeah. Because you're, this is why the Bible talks about why fellowship is such an important discipline oh, yeah. among right. believers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not simply so you can hang out or you can collect money because, you know, we need people to fund our next building fund. <laughs> yeah. No, it's actually to be in relationship, be in community Absolutely. with one another. So you could see, oh, you know what? Like, Ricardo's doing really well there. Yeah. Let me ask him how he got there, yeah. Yeah. right? Or you might say, oh, you know, I see Alex, he's, he's actually kind of going through a tough time right now. Yeah. So yeah. when he's acting in a certain way that's not his character. Yeah. He, he, someone might say, oh, that guy, he's like like really, you know, he's got a problem. And you'd be like, yeah, you know what? But you know what? I know the backstory. Yeah. Yeah. Give him yeah. some grace. Yeah. Give yeah. him a little bit of room. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Or like, come and support him. Exactly. Yeah. Instead like, of saying, you know what? Let's banish him, yeah. right? We'll say, you know what? Why don't we come in communion? Yeah. You know what? We're going to his house Tuesday evening yeah. after work. We're just going to hang out. There's no, like, yeah. program. No real really I'm just bringing, yeah. I'm coming in my sweatpants. I'm bringing yeah. a half bag of wings. 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 Oh, yeah. and don't come empty handed. That's, that's it. Yeah, stop on, like, pick something up on the yeah. way. You know, like I'm feeling down. <laughs> that's what I'm saying, right? But that's what community looks like. Yeah. Because yeah. now when you see that man's success, you actually celebrating his success, oh, yeah. you're right? Because you're like, it. you've seen the struggle. Yeah. So now you're, you see him on the come up now. And you're yeah. like, I know where he, I know, I know where John was. Yeah. I know where, you know, the, or my fellow brother was, I've seen him. Yeah. I've seen him at his lowest point. And I've seen what he's overcome. Yeah. I've seen the kind of man he was to his wife, but look at him now. Yeah. I've seen the kind of father he was, the way he neglected his children, but look at him now. Yeah. You know? And we may not even realize that when we do these things, we're sowing currency not only for the benefit of the changes we'll see now, mm. but think about the generations that will come by you being part of helping somebody get aligned with being a godly man. And you know right. what the missing yeah. part is? And I'm thinking about this out loud now. It's, it's not a fully fleshed out point, but, you know, they can, <laughs> they can edit it out and post it. Um, Just let it but go. the thing that connects manliness and loneliness in that gap is anxiety. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Talk about it. And we're going to figure this out together. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to figure it out together. <laughs> we're going to figure it out together. Okay. But the thought comes to me because... Yeah. Fear has its biggest grip. What fear will do is try to isolate. Yeah. Mm. It's not until you come in connection with another person and share that struggle, share that concern. Now, fear doesn't have the same grip Mm because now you have support. Yeah. Now it's, uh, no one's ever dealt with the problem I've had before Mm. until I talk to you and then you say, you know what, I I went through that that a couple years ago actually. Or you know what, I know there's a solution to that problem, right? It's like you got this like uh, leak in your house you don't know where it's coming from, Mm -hmm. right? And you fear that your house is just gonna collapse, right? Because 
But then you start talking to your neighbors, and they'll be like, oh, yeah. I've had that. Yeah, yeah, I've had that. You know, My house is leaking right yeah, now. Yeah, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> Don't worry. Do this. Use some duct yeah. tape or here, call this guy or yeah. whatever, right? And all of a sudden, that fear that your house is just going to drown, yeah. right? Now you're like, oh, okay, hold on. My neighbor across the street dealt with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? But somehow in our society, the way society is shaped, unfortunately, it's become more and more isolating. You notice oh, that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, that's true. Like, that's almost like we live problem. in silos. Yeah. And it's hard. It actually takes a tremendous amount of startup energy, capital energy, mm. to make those connections and then maintain them. Right. Right? Because mm. as we get older, um, I, I, I think, you know, research definitely has shown this, but I think personally, anecdotally anyway, you can see this, that it's a lot easier for kids to make friends, right? You just yeah. throw them in the room, lock the yeah. door, and, yeah. you know, and 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 in six <laughs> minutes, they're like best friends, best friend, you know? Yeah, yeah. They don't even friend. know the guy's name. It's like, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're best friends for life, right? Um, but into adulthood, it's much harder to do that, yeah. Yeah. right? I got a job. I got, you yeah. know, the responsibilities. I got to make sure yeah. I feed my family. I got to have some me time. I got to sleep, you know? Yeah. And next, you know, there's no, there's no time for extra connection, yeah. right. right? And because of that lack of connection, now we're, we're, we're seeing rates of fear increase, yeah. rates of depression mm. increase, rates of anxiety increase yeah. among men. Right. And if I were the devil, right, and I want to destroy... Uh, I would start with the with the man, Absolutely. right? You get him first, yeah. the family will follow. Yeah, yeah, right. And unfortunately, we see that a lot in society, don't we? Yeah, yeah right. That's true. If you take out the man, then the family starts to disintegrate. Right. It takes so much more energy, unfortunately, for a single mom to take care of things. Not that she can't, she, but that's not her role. Yeah. Right. 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 You know, many moms step up and they're superheroes in their own right, but they shouldn't have to be in that position. Right. I don't know a right? single. To be a candid, I don't know a single single mother who's like, yay, I'm a single mother. I did all that hard work and I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I don't know a single woman to say that. No. Every single single mother I know, they're like, I wish I had a, like a strong man to help yeah. me. It may have been okay yeah. in the beginning, yeah. but then like, it, like when they realize like how hard it is to like try to do two jobs in one and still go to school, go to work, pick up your kids... It, it's yeah. it's hard, and that's yeah. clearly because that wasn't God's design. Now, obviously, we know circumstance. Like maybe if like yeah. your spouse died, that's different. But I'm talking about right, people right. who like actually, we're talking about the ideal design, yes, right? Yeah. Right. But um, one thing I want to say to, to your point, because I think it's really important, is I think we need to foster ways to make relationships authentically. To, to make people connect authentically. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe what I'm saying is part of the reason why loneliness creeps in so much is because do men feel safe, right? Do they feel yeah. like if I connect with Pastor Mark, like is Pastor Mark going to be like real enough to be like, yeah, I'm Pastor Mark, but I'm yeah. also Mark, yeah. right? Yeah. And like, and like uh, you know, no tie, forget the yeah. suit. Yeah. Like if I have something like Pastor Mark, like, you know, like I, I need some help. Yeah maybe financially, emotionally, maybe spiritually, whatever, yeah. right? But it's like, do I feel safe enough to do that? And I think that's one thing that a lot of men, I think, struggle with, but never actually talk about it. I think it's just assumed that we all kind of just... Figure it out. Just figure it out. It's always like a figure it out thing. And I'm like, but at what point do men start taking accountability and responsibility to say, like, look, I need help, or hey, I need relationship, yeah. or hey... I'm struggling with something and I need my brothers to come alongside me. Like, I don't think it's, I don't think it's safe to say that all men are suffering in silence, but I would say a lot of men probably are. Yeah, I'd say right. So. And, and I think that's, it's a shame because there's so like, even in our own local church, there's so many men in our church who mm -hmm. like are gifted or skilled mm -hmm. who can do things. Like I'm about to call someone to come fix something in my house. Yeah. Right. Cause like, <laughs> anyway, but the point is like, I recognize that, okay, I need help with something, not my specialty, but I know there's men who could probably at least guide me. Yeah. Right? I don't need to sit there and be like, oh, I don't know how to do plumbing. Right? It's like, okay, but there's plumbers in our church or people who could be like, let's yeah. do this, do this, do this, and boom. Right? So, but that's just a simple example. What happens when you're actually struggling? And then the more you feel sa unsafe or you feel like no one can relate to you, you start to isolate. But I think the, yeah, the big yeah. challenge is, and as we sort of tr transition to closing off, the big challenge is a lot of the times when we, when we need somebody, we haven't, we haven't built up the capital to, to tap into them. Yeah. Meaning, what that means is <clears throat> the Bible says, he that you know, wants friends should show himself friendly. 
Mm -hmm. You can't wait till you're in a problem to sort of make that friend and then go yeah. deep in. Yeah. And so it goes back to your point that I think it was your point that we need that fellowship. We need to naturally connect, not because we need somebody right now or I'm going through something. We need to just naturally connect to naturally be around each other so that we we build up that relationship so that when we do have that need, we have a, a plethora of, of, of brothers Absolutely. to go to and, and we've already um, invested in that trust. You know, yeah. I can trust Alex, he can trust me. You know, yeah. I, I've seen, we, we've sort of gone through things together. We've talked through certain issues. Now I have a real issue. I'm gonna go to Ricardo, I'm gonna go to Alex yeah. and I'm like, listen man, I don't have it anymore and I don't yeah. know what's happening. Or even to be even more real. And, and again, this is what I'm talking about in terms of being real, like even uh, sexually. You yeah. know what I mean? Things can be happening that you're like, honestly, I don't know how to fix, I don't it. Know how to fix it. And I'm not going to go and teach a lesson and say, hey, you know, I yeah. have this problem. But you need, to, you need to reach out to a brother, have a beer, watch a, uh, you know, an NBA game and say, hey, yeah. how have you dealt with this in your early stages of marriage? Yeah. It, where do we do that? Right? So I think that that's important that we have those, those networks that we... we we invest in prior to needing that, yeah. you know, that circle or that, that circle of, of friends. Yeah. We have to do it before and, and that, has, that, has, that has to be natural, but it speaks to men's group in churches. It speaks to outings that happen socially where all brothers should tap into it. And so as we sort of wrap up. Wait, maybe, yeah, maybe let me just yeah, add yeah. one practical yeah. thing because I actually tried to do something um, so maybe I'm not using the right words, but essentially what I'm saying is, for me, there was one brother like in our church, I won't name, mm -hmm. but there was one brother in, my, in our church where I was like, this brother has asked for, like, he put himself out there and said, like, I'm looking for a relationship I'll never forget. And yeah. I told him, like, man, I'll be your friend, like, yeah, whatever, yeah. right? And I respected that because yeah. it was like, to even put yourself out there like that, it's like, hard. that's, that's yeah. especially in an environment, like, a social environment like ours, where it's not necessarily the easiest to navigate if you don't, if you're not careful, but for him to even say that to me was just like, wow. And I remember, like, I just said to him, like, hey, man, like, I'm, I'm going on a road trip one day. Yeah. You want to reach? And he yeah. reached. Yeah. And we've been connected ever since. Wow. And it's just been... For me, it, and then our families got closer, they've yeah. been to our house, like yeah. we got out for dinner. Like it's just, it leads to other things to help build that currency. Right. So that for me now, I think the place we're at is if he has, a, if he has trouble, this guy will pick up the phone, call me. He'll video yeah. call me. Yeah. Bro, I need you to talk to you. Cool. Yeah. Maybe if we didn't have like that it'd bridge, be it'd kind of be more awkward, kind of yeah. like, oh, like Brother Rose. I'm like, okay, yeah. it's Ricardo, right? <laughs> no, but I'm serious, right? And then That's also true. maybe one last thing before we transition is I think some people might have the notion that if I'm help, I need to go to the pastor. Yeah. I don't think that's, I don't think that's necessarily, like there are things where the pastor has to deal with it. But I think the way that Jesus wants us to be in fellowship with one another is that we should be, so connected that you shouldn't have to burden your pastor with every small little thing that's going on in your life because maybe God, maybe your pastor is not even necessarily equipped to deal with that. Yeah. Maybe it's something that another brother who's maybe dealing with it or has maybe recently overcome can maybe help you with yeah, yeah. because the pastor needs to pastor the church, right? So it's just, there's, I think there's a lot of different things that we could say about it, but I think as godly men, we should be sharpening ourselves to be available and able to support one another at the very least and in, and at the very least in the things of god yeah. right but you know there's there's so much practicality that we if we had more time we could probably go into like how do we actually do this thing yeah. but i really think it's it's it sometimes takes like small things that you can do like invite somebody out like yeah. after church like hey man let's go out let's go like you say, grab a drink, yeah. go to this restaurant, or, or hey, you know what? Let the wives go hang out. You and I will go hang out. Like, there's nothing yeah. wrong with that stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Anyway, sorry. So, you know, as we come to the end, I guess maybe, maybe we all can just share, um, you know, a word of advice yeah. or two to any brother who's watching this and might be in any of those situations or is asking that question. Um, is godliness still relevant in today's world? What would your advice be? What would your advice be to the, the brother who's sitting and I'm like, God, I needed to hear this. Um, what do I do next? 
You know, what would your thoughts be? What would your advice be to that brother? Yeah, my, <clears throat> my you know, my advice uh, would be, uh, one, uh, pray about it. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it should be understated. Uh, we are spiritual beings, and uh, as godly men, much like I used the example earlier of David, we ought to gird ourselves, strengthen ourselves up in the Lord first. Yeah. To put our trust in God first. Say, listen, you say you take care of my needs. This is a need. Hmm. So I'm putting, I'm submitting it to you. Then on, on a, a practical level, uh, looking, and, and it's hard. I think it's hard. Um, but putting yourself out there is probably the first practical step you can do. Almost like in the example Ricardo used of the, and saying, hey, I'm looking for a relationship. Yeah. Sometimes you got to put yourself out there and say, mm-hmm. hey, I have this need. Yeah. Who can help me with this? Yeah. That's it takes hard. tremendous amount of vulnerability yeah. to do it. Yeah. But he put himself out there and whatever fear or anxieties he had of it were overcome with the benefits that came with that need being met. Yeah. Can you imagine, Ricardo, if he still had that need today? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So true. And wow. So often we're just, we get trapped. I don't know if you had this experience where you've had this, you know, you're like fretting and worrying and it's like analysis by, by uh, paralysis. Yeah. And then finally you do the thing and you're like, yeah. oh, that wasn't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, why did I do it years ago? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want us men to fall into that yeah. pattern. Yeah. If there's a need, let's go after it. Yeah. Because on the other side of that hard thing, yeah. there's such a better life on the other side. Oh, yeah. Right. So right. let's not forget about it. Let's not dismiss it. Right. But let's take hold of it. Yeah. It's yeah. Huge. I think I think godly living is still relevant in this time, Pastor Mark. I think that God still wants men to be distinct, mm-hmm. holy. You know, that's Alicia's like my wife's favorite word, like holy. But distinct, holy, set apart, and men that are available for his use. Because I think one thing that we don't do is we don't celebrate we don't celebrate godly men enough we almost always go to the negatives Mm. if you notice like it's always like every time something's going on like with a pastor or somebody's ministry it's always because it's negative yeah but it's like but what about the men who are actually holding down the responsibilities men who are actually trying to be examples for their families for their maybe congregations or ministerial responsibilities and the people who are looking up to them and it's like but most importantly like like I'm, I want to live a godly life because I want to glorify my father. Yeah. Like that's like that's my heart's desire. I think if there's any encouragement I would want to give to a brother who's listening to us, or maybe a man who's like, I don't know, like, can I really do this thing? You can do this thing. Yeah. If there's if there's one thing I know, God never asks us to do something that He doesn't expect that we can fill, yeah. f- that we can finish, or we can do. And He always gives us everything we need. We just got to go after it. Right. Right. So it's hard. Because in a lot of ways, we have to make conscious decisions to say, I'm not going to do this. Or because I love God, I want to honor him. I'm going to choose to do this or go this way. But you can do it. You can definitely do it. There's people in the church who are actually planted there by God to assist you. But like Alex said, we got to sometimes put ourselves out there if we're struggling. And also be the safe space that you want to see. Like that's probably one thing I want to stress. Right? And I'm trying to practice this myself. That if somebody approaches me, I respect the fact that if somebody's even reaching out to me to be like a form of help. Like, I respect that. Yeah. Because it takes a lot to be vulnerable, especially in today's day and age where it's like we promote individuality. We, want, we expect people to be strong and expect people to that's get things done. But if somebody's like, despite all of that and all the expectations and the societal pressures, I still realize that I need help. Can you help me? Like, I respect that. So I would say, brothers, like, reach out, but also be what you want to see as much as you possibly can so that it can also, it can be a reciprocal relationship. I think that's the thing about relationships. It can't just be one-sided. It needs to be reciprocal in that you can help me, I can help you, and even if we can't help each other, at least we're still available resources to one another. And maybe with relationships comes connections. Yeah. Like, there's people that I know who can help you. Right. Maybe an area that I can't, but I can get you connected. Right. It's the same thing, like, when you're, like, looking for a job. Like, there's people who've come to me, and they're like, hey, man, can you help me get a job? And I'm like, maybe the job you're looking for, I can't get you directly, 
but maybe I can help get you in. Right. Or maybe I can help you with your resume. Or maybe I can get you connected to this person. And it's just like, I think it's the same way with the kingdom. There's so many things. There's so many gifts and talents and connections in the kingdom of God. But it requires a man to be cognizant of the fact that he's not an island. Right. Like, I'm not in this thing alone. I need to reach out. I need to be connected. And I also need to be the space that I want to see so that God can use me to as an available resource for somebody else. Right? So, but you can do it, That's brother. Huge. You can do it. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think both of you have sort of captured the majority, but I think if there's one thing I would add in addition is confidence. Yeah. It's that confidence. And I think as a man, I know my life changed when I got that confidence in God. And my confidence, it stemmed from seeing myself in a different light. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, uh, you know, this, this self-motivation or that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. There was a, there was a point in my life where I said, I identify with being a child of God and, and everything that comes along with being a child of God and mm -hmm. a man of God is, is sort of speaking to strength. And I embrace that shift and it changed everything. It changed what I was afraid of. It changed um, me stepping out and it changed me uh, being vulnerable. So all of those things changed when I sort of got that confidence in God and I knew who I was and knew that I wouldn't always do things right and sometimes you'd make mistakes and sometimes people would laugh, but it didn't matter. I was secure in, in being, um, uh, you know, I was resolved in being a man of God. And sometimes as a man of God, you're gonna be alone. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to have to make tough decisions when everybody else is sort of following the crowd and yeah. you're going to have to have that confidence. So in addition to everything that is being said, there is a time where you draw the line in the sand and you're like, I have to be alone. Yeah. Uh, there is a time when you don't want to be alone and you need to, to you know, out of that confidence, um, step out and say, hey, I need, I need help. So, but I think that that confidence and identity, that was a, a, a moment of change for me and I would encourage anyone um, who is not really sure what godliness looks like or, or not really sure how to navigate that in today's day and age, I think having that confidence in God and making sure identity, you see yourself in a different way, I think that that will make the difference. Can I just add one last thing yeah, to that? Because I think it's important for us to note that while we might look for examples like locally here, don't forget, we have the scriptures. Yeah. Like for me, I sometimes take great encouragement by seeing the examples that are the timeless examples. Like you were talking about a man of God. Like I'll, even as you were talking about, think about Daniel. Yeah. Think about the pressure that Daniel was probably under when the king's decree came out that not only should you not be praying to your God, you have to pray to the king. Yeah. And Daniel's like, nah. what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think he, I don't even, it was just like, no, I serve God. Yeah. Even with the fear of being tossed into the lions then, yeah. And don't forget, like, he had a governmental position. So it's not like he didn't have nothing to lose. Like, he wasn't just being thrown because he was praying. Yeah. He had a lot to lose, right? And he was a prominent figure. But we saw the end result, right? Also thinking about, like, Elijah, yeah. right? Like, who's going to be standing for the Lord, right? Eli it was him versus the 450 false prophets of Baal, right? But he's like, I'm standing with God. And I think yeah. that confidence comes from knowing your identity. I think going back to something you earlier said, something you said earlier which was that a man of god finds his identity in god yeah. like that cannot be understated yeah. enough like you're not yeah. gonna find it just by looking at examples of people you gotta know god for yourself right and you gotta find your identity in god so that your confidence is not wishy-washy exactly. or circumstantial exactly. it's i know who i am i don't have it all together i may struggle but at the end of the at day, the end of the day yeah. i know who i am yeah Amen. right yeah. So, no, it's been a good session. I appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Ricardo. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, it's been a blessing. So hopefully we can connect on another level, and hopefully we'll see everyone in the next podcast.